Fez, we're going to get to your notes, a ton of them today, some really good actionable advice. But as you were sitting down, you were taking a look at the number and you said, has tonight settled into a solid seven? Why don't you just kind of riff on that a little bit? Let the casual better know what you mean by a solid seven tonight with the Lions laying it, what it means to you. So earlier in the week, Detroit was laying eight, eight and a half, and all the money has been on Las Vegas. Jimmy G, obviously, quarterbacking, making a little bit of an upgrade versus the stiffs that we have as our backup quarterbacks, Hoyer and O'Connell, although Hoyer O'Connell looked very good in August. So went to seven and a half, and then it went to seven. I got to be honest, Patrick, I'm not nearly as excited when I have bet a game that's lined at seven versus 7.25, well, what do I mean by that? Well, when it's 7.25, I got a lot better options because if I play the favorite, I get help versus the line. I can lay seven. I can tease a seven down to one. If I play the dog, I can take seven and a half on the Raiders. And now that option, Raiders plus seven and a half, which in my notes, I said that if you like the Raiders play plus seven and a half, it's no longer available. Can you expand a little bit to people that may not understand or might be new to the show in terms of when you say seven versus 7.25? Because most people probably perplexed right now by that statement. Sure. So a 7.25 line would be when half the books have seven and half have seven and a half. I'll use an example from last Sunday. Kansas City, for the longest time, was laying 7.25 at Denver, where if you like Denver, you could take plus seven and a half. And if you like KC, you could lay seven. And obviously, it doesn't land seven. You're like, well, what good is that? Well... For every game like that, or most games like that, there's the occasional Washington-Philly, which for a long time was 6.75, Washington um, catching seven, Philly laying six and a half. Well, guess what? Fiddle in the middle. It lands on seven. Everybody wins. If you lost that game betting the side, you should never bet again. You should retire and play poker. Because if you bet Philly, you should have won laying six and a half. And if you bet Washington, you should have pushed and gotten plus seven. Well, you do have in your notes, and by the way, uh, it's, I don't know if it's the black T-shirt, but... You, you're still working out and losing some weight, Fez. Looking, looking good there. I give you credit. The you said tonight, if you bet Detroit, you should be teasing them. And you said if you're betting Vegas, you should be looking for the hook. So you should be looking for seven and a half. Let's talk about those two angles. I don't think you're going to get the seven and a half. So we'll talk. We'll get we'll get to Vegas shortly. But if you're if we're playing Detroit. I think you could, you could certainly look to take Detroit from minus seven down to minus one in a six point teaser or down to minus a half in a six and a half point teaser. If you like some stuff this coming week, Wong teasers, teasing through this three and seven. Now I know I'm not teasing through the three and seven because it's already seven. So I want to tease seven and a half point favorites, but I want to tease home favorites. Detroit qualifies. I actually think it's a really good spot for Detroit to get healthy again after the disappointment last week um, against Baltimore. So I would lean at the current number to Detroit. So I think that that would probably be the optimal way to play the Lions. But you know what, frankly, with this already down to seven, I would much prefer this. I'd like to see the Lions minus seven lay a dollar 20 because there's 10 extra cents of VIG that are going to come on the Lions. But it isn't going to hurt you any if you play teasers. But here in Vegas, teasers are donezo because now they're charging you every book in Vegas. Six-point teaser, minus $1.25. That's a bridge too far. You're not going to win laying $1.25. So just don't play those teasers in Vegas anymore. Play them at DraftKings where it's minus $1.20. Real quick, you mentioned teasing this football game, but also you said it's a good spot for Detroit. I tend to agree with you coming off an embarrassment against Baltimore. How do you determine for yourself which game you're going to potentially tease or which game you'd lay a number with simply based on uh, whether it's 7, 8, or 9. Like, perfect example, last night, Chargers 9.5, and, and I'm sure some people teased the Chargers down. Probably not the most prudent play, but either way, whether you tease it or you lay it, you won. Yeah, so in the last 10 years, great question. I don't think I bet other than in contests or maybe right at post a little bit, but any dog plus 1.5, plus 2, plus 2.5, I never bet those uh, because I can just tease them, and I like the teaser better. So I lost. I, I teased Pittsburgh from plus two to plus eight. So that was a long teaser that didn't get there and was a loser. Yeah, but that's a, on paper, that's a great play. Yeah, and then by contrast, on the favorites, I haven't laid seven and a half, minus eight, or minus eight and a half in years and years because I can just tease them. I can tease them minus eight down to minus two, and mathematically, as long as I'm getting a six-point teaser at minus um, 120 or less, that is the better play. I'm going to have to rethink that betting in Vegas. And, you know, eventually – you know, take advantage of these teaser odds because uh, bold prediction three years from now, I don't think you're going to see minus 120 teasers available anywhere in the NFL at six points. You just think simply because the numbers have gotten so sharp, there's so much information, and when you look at the spreads, the six point has a profound impact on the game. Yeah, the 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 word is out enough, you know, on how to play these teasers profitably, and frankly, they're a loss leader for the most part 
people playing the long teasers, and the, but the reason that they're still out there is because people want to have their own opinions. They're going to tease fives up to 11s, and they're going to tease eights up to plus eights to plus 14s, and people are making enough bad teasers and teasing college football to offset that. Don't tease college football. Just don't do it. Although, if you see a Big Ten total at 31, the next Iowa game, I guess maybe Air, you know, if there was a college game to tease, like you look at Air Force um, and a 33 total here, and maybe, maybe I don't know if it's Air Force, Army, or Navy. I've gotten confused. Army. There you go. That's uh, that's one that you think there's probably going to be 33 points scored, plus or minus seven, right? Well, your Northwestern team right now, Iowa, this week, 30 and a half on the total. <laughs> wow, you know, Northwestern hurt my feelings. I um, when when Fitzpatrick um, Fitzgerald got fired. I um, I was jamming in Northwestern under three and a half wins, so I thought this was the greatest bet ever, and it closes yes. three. Well, last time I checked the win, and someone texted me. This is funny, Patrick. It's like, does the win against Howard count as a win for Northwestern? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, last time I checked, it doesn't say number of wins against non-Howard teams. <laughs> yes, it does count. We did lose. I'm sorry. Yes. Well, now, you've done a lot of winning in your career. Professional handicapper Steve Fezzik joining us live, and we appreciate him driving down to the D there with Amal Shaw and Dustin and Sweetelson. Uh, now, for those that don't know, the biggest sports betting contest right now on the planet, Circa Millions and the Super Contests. Uh, it, before Circa Millions came along, Steve Fezzik, you won over at the Westgate the, Circa con the Super Contest twice in your career. Now we transition over to Circa Millions where you're sitting top 10. You're 29 and 11 right now let's walk through this that's pretty damn impressive so it is so hard to compete with six thousand people i go to poker pro mike Madisau once said it's not gonna be easy to get all these chips not gonna be easy to beat six thousand people you got to beat everybody you're gonna have to run good and how good do you have to run well like i said i'm gonna be in the top 10 i don't think i'm gonna be in the top five we'll see after tonight but the uh i've had a winning record in every week. It's we're, we're eight weeks in. We're almost halfway there. Every week I've had a winning record, and I'm still, you know, just cracking the top 10. It's 29 and 11. It's just really, really hard. I went back, and I looked, and one year I won the Westgate. There was only 300 people that year. I won with a 53 and 31 and 1 record. So think about that. I was only 22 games above 500, and I was able to win a contest at the end of the year. Now I'm I'm, I'm, what, you know, 19 games above 500, and I'm barely sniffing into the top 10. Uh, Patrick, a couple things to follow up with. First of all, Steve, I went back around 2019. I looked at 10 years of the Westgate history of the winners. you got to get around 71% to be able to win, and that was based on when we had a 16, uh, 85 games over the 16-game mm -hmm. schedule. Now it's gone to 90 because, remember, you've got 17 games plus the additional bye week, so that makes it even more challenging. And to Steve's point, right now, what are you at, 72.5%? Yeah, right. If, yes. And, and the the bottom line is, like, I see this all the time. There's so much misinformation. By the way, when I read a poker book, like Ed Miller or anybody else, I agree with 80% on Schlesinger. 80% of it's really good. All right. When I read blackjack books, same thing. Schlesinger's a blackjack author. Um, when I read sports betting books, they're almost always chock full of misinformation and just just false statements. Like, I hear all the time, guys, oh, this is a tough week in the NFL. If only I could go three and two. I'd be happy. What is what? It, 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 I'm going to say it. People could get mad at me. I'm going to I'm going Fezzik Twitter. That's just a stupid statement. Three and two is terrible. Three and two is like it, it, immediately you can't win the quarterly prize. And if you keep stacking three and two after three and twos, you're you're going to be done. So you're going to be so far behind in these contests. I would rather flip a coin, flip five coins, and take whatever the coin told me than to than to be assigned to three and two because it's just not going to be good enough. Now, if I'm 20 games above 500. Maybe I'll take the three and two instead of flipping the coin. Yeah, depending on how far down the line you get. Just one follow-up, Patrick, real quick. You mentioned about Mattisau talking about a poker tournament. Here's one thing, though, it's an advantage in a poker tournament. Let's say you, Dustin, Patrick, and I are in a tournament. If you take out Patrick, I don't have to. I just got to get the chips from you, in essence, right? And we're in this contest. You are literally up against every player in this one, depending, obviously, where they stake out in the standings. Yes, and, and you know, and a big difference also, and people never talk about this, in a poker tournament, chip in a chair, you can come all the way back. You can be below the chip leader halfway through and you're fine you do one double up yeah. and, and now you, you, you go from 75 to 150,000 and you get one more double up and you're in the top 10 
in sports betting, back to that 60%, if you're at 55%, we're halfway there. People are like, I'm sitting fine. I'm at 55%. No, you're not sitting fine. You're done. So you're, you, you are out of the top 10, barring an epic um, statistical um, anomaly. And you're really just trying to get, trying to claw your way into the money. I mean, your equity is negative. If you're at 57%, your equity is negative. Uh, like Patrick mentioned, you're going to have to hit you know, 70% to finish you know, top 10 probably. So how'd you do this weekend at Circa Millions? Four and one. Jeez. I'll take I'll take that every week and 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 just as far as you know we talk about Plinko Gil, Gil Alexander I love this you know the little hockey puck and prices right does it fall into cover or non cover well I had the Jets minus two and a half so the Plinko puck went into the cover <laughs> obviously I got the good number and that's why I'm bringing that up and the Plinko Cup on Washington Philly do, 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 fell into the Philly bucket at minus six and a half now people are like are oh, well you're lucky you got minus six and a half and I'm like well yes. But I never would have played Philly minus seven. I mean, that's part of good contest strategy. If we could, Dustin, I want you to jump in on for, with this one as well because interesting conversation. You could kind of see Fezzik's mind working when, Steve, you posed the question about Jared Goff tonight as far as the prop market. You want to throw that out there? Yeah, so will Goff get a touchdown tonight? So I saw that, like, the yes was 6-1, to one, the no was, like, minus 900. And off the top of my head, I was like, I, I don't recall Goff over his career scoring touchdowns. Maybe the no is good, but, Dustin, the data this year uh, belies that thought, right? Yeah, uh, he currently has two rushing touchdowns this year. And the thought about the no made a lot of sense because in 2022, he had zero. In 2021, he had zero. You have to go back to 2020, where he had four rushing touchdowns for him to run one in. Yeah, and obviously, this is an example where we might have a data of 40 games, but I'm going to weight this year's data more than I am the prior two years. So, gun to my head, my goodness, with two touchdowns already, if I had to bet it, which I don't, so I won't bet it, I would bet yes, not no. Okay, using some data right there. And you wrote in your notes earlier today, in general, Fezzik, you said betting systems and trends are overrated. That doesn't mean they're all useless, just a little overrated. What do you mean by that? I think too often we see people, you should never be making a play just based upon a trend. You should be able to, as an example, if you see a college football trend and like a team, I, I heard a good one from Ralph Michaels, who's a great handicapper, and this trend makes sense. When a team suffers their seventh loss of the year so they can no longer become bowl eligible, those teams have a really bad against the spread record. It's like 42%. And I was thinking to myself, that's a, that's a great trend because it makes so much sense. You're demoralized. Hey, our season's done, so we cannot go to a bowl game anymore. Um, and then there's other trends that make sense, like, like when the armed forces play, the games go under, and both teams defend the option. And it just makes so much sense, and they keep lowering these totals. They were in the like low 50s, and now they're in the low 30s, and they still keep going under the Army, Navy, Air Force games. But other trends are just random. Who cares if under a harvest moon when a team is wearing orange <laughs> and, and it's an odd date and the spread is between 8 and 11 and the total is between 40 and 44, you've gotten 19 and, and 0 to the under. Irrelevant. You know, you, you walk, walk through a casino, look at every roulette wheel. You're going to see 19 and 2 red and black runs. It's, it doesn't mean anything. So if there are a bunch of qualifiers that just make no sense that are just randomly out there, Go ahead and throw it in the garbage can. You're, you're not going to make money betting those. I, tr I like your breakdown on trends. I kind of equate trends, uh, trends to uh, turnovers, Patrick. Some of them are applicable, but you just don't know when and where they're going to occur and when it's going to kind of go out of fashion. And turnovers are a great example because all turnovers are not rated yeah. equal. You know, fumbles are somewhat random, not completely. I mean, obviously, you see a really good defense doing, you know, the punch out. But the, as far as interceptions, that's not random as well. There's some quarterbacks, obviously, Rodgers always took care of the ball and was probably a little too careful throwing down the field as um, opposed to, um, I'm trying to think of who would be interception. Um, Josh Allen? Nathan Peterman. Oh, well. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yes, there, there's gunslingers <laughs> just out fell there. fell off a cliff. <laughs> that would just throw the ball down, down the field. So um, I, they're not completely random. You know, one thing that's underutilized is, and I think, one of your shows says it should be an interception stat. Like when a guy throws an interception-worthy play and the defense just drops it, that should certainly count against the quarterback also. Well, you also note in your notes, so how do pros win? And you said, look, what we do is we specialize. Also, we look at the props market. For example, yesterday you gave your clients, Jalen Hurts, under 38 rush yards. Yeah, so we're right now at the sports equinox, and the equinox represents in – 
on the calendar, you know, an equal number of sunlight, 12 hours of night, 12 hours a day. So it's a balanced point where the Earth is shifting from in terms of the southern and the northern hemisphere getting more sunlight. But the problem with balance in sports betting is you don't want balance. You don't want to be spending three hours hockey handicapping and three hours NBA and three hours NFL and three hours college football specialize in one sport. And on this is just one example. I could, I could, you know, give hundreds if I was better at this. But um, if you were watching the Eagles game against Miami, you saw at halftime he put a brace on. And then in the second half, he didn't run as much. And then when they interviewed him at the end of the game, the sideline reporter asked, asked him, how is your knee? And he's like, you know, it'll, it'll be okay. Like he's peeved that he even got asked the question. So shocker, with that knee brace the week before, um, I didn't think Hurts would run as much. I thought it was a seven-point favorite. Probably the Eagles felt they could win without you know, making him susceptible to more injury, and he ran the ball very little. So that's just one of, like, you know, literally dozens and dozens of types of bets that you should be looking to bet. But guess what? You're probably not going to be able to identify them if you're spending two hours a night watching hockey. Um, it's fun. If you're just doing this for recreation, absolutely bet all the sports. If you want to win, focus on one sport. You know, Patrick, I think Steve brings up arguably one of the most important points we discuss on this show. Perfect example in baseball. I can tell you right now in the entire uh, 2023 calendar year, I was involved in one Baltimore Orioles game. I tend to focus in on the National League, particularly the National League West and the National League East. I don't bet American League Central games. Uh, don't bet a ton of AL games in general. And I think his point is extremely well made. I'm a big college football and college basketball guy. College basketball, I follow certain conferences. I follow the Metro Atlantic. Uh, that's a league that most people probably don't follow that closely, MAAC. But if you pay attention to it, I think it's a huge advantage. And he's right. There's just only so many hours in a day. There's only so many teams and so many sports you can follow. And I think when people get too deep into the woods, uh, weeds on certain things, it, real, it becomes a real challenge. You know, I'll use an example with college basketball season right around the corner. I'm going to make a recommendation. I've never heard anybody do this before, all right? But I'm going to do it. I would pick a conference that has that is spread out geographically because think about it if, if you had a conference where everybody was with 100 miles of each other there's never a really difficult road trip in conference whereas you look at like the big 12 and these poor teams have to schlep out to like 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 you know uh, manhattan kansas in the middle of the year um that's a really tough road trip if you're in west virginia etc and i don't think that the, the you know the initial opening number is typically just based upon a power rating of each team. And if you're just looking for really bad spots for teams, I think you're going to get the edge. Well, specialization, that's one. I like the notes here. I'm just going to continue. He said almost every better should devote considerable more time getting better at how they bet. What's that distinction? Better at how they bet. You know, so often, and I'm going to, a guy that I think is very talented and belongs in the Sports Betting Hall of Fame. By the way, I think sports bettors belong in the Sports Betting Hall of Fame, not administrators, not people that like, like, like push you know, papers back and forth and make sure you don't, you know, violate any gaming rules. But uh, that's just me. So I like in a poker in a poker uh, hall of fame, they have poker players, not poker room managers, but that's just me. <laughs> um, so Alan Boston certainly would belong, but Alan Boston said one thing that I strongly disagree with. They asked him, well, how are you going to, how are you going to do your homework? And then what do you bet? And he says, Oh, I research all my teams. I come out with who I like. And then I look at the screen. And I bet the best number makes sense. Right. But now, wait a minute, it should go further. It should, you should be thinking about, well, now, wait, maybe I want to bet one of these team totals on this team, or maybe I want to bet the first half or the second half. There's, with, with a really large menu, why not try to identify teams that um, struggle in certain areas and take advantage, or better in other areas, and take advantage of that? Alan Boston, one of the great college basketball betters back in the day. Part of the great book. What's the book title? That was great by Millman. Yeah, so The Odds is a top 10 sports betting book. You know, I was just at the win today, and I was talking to Doug Costanza, who was in that book, um, along with Bob Scucci and Joe Lupo, who's back in Vegas. He's the president of the Hard Rock, which took over for the Mirage. So he probably will come out and yell at me again when if I come over there and try to play. Um, but the the book documents, you know, the sports book, the old Stardust, and it was the year of the greatest show on turf, and they had huge liability on the St. Louis Rams, 200 to one to win it all with Kurt Warner, the bag, the grocery bagging quarterback. That was the best quarterback ever, and um, professional gamblers. And it talked about Alan Boston's wild ride in his purple Corvette into the strip, making bets and ramming and jamming. That was a great book. It was. It really was. I give credit where credit's due. That was a tremendous book. We got a minute and a half. We'll come back and talk about some of the props and some of the plays tonight. Monday Night Football with the Lions, of course, hosting to close Week Eight 
the Raiders. You do have in your notes, just randomly, so if you want to run with it, feel free. Rogue numbers, first and second half. Yeah, so it's a standalone game. I love standalone games. Why? Normally, if you have a seven-point favorite, you're just going to see the first half is going to be minus four, and you're going to see, based upon the mathematics, the same team totals. But inevitably, there's going to be a, a backer at whale stumbling over and making a max bet on something where they'll take it. And so you'll see books adjust for that and try to get um, buyback on the other side. And usually the betters are betting the favorite and they're betting on the over. So it wouldn't surprise me if you like the Raiders, you might get a bargain. You might get Raiders at post plus four, like reduced VIG. Second half, you might get the Raiders at a uh, much better number. So I would not bet the Raiders plus seven. There's probably a much better way to get at the Raiders with rogue numbers as, as, as kickoff approaches. And you said during the break, I wrote it down, Circuit just went to Lions 7.1. Let's let a listener know exactly what you mean by that and what you start to think. So what the heck is Detroit minus 7.1? By the way, I always say the minus to avoid any possible confusion. So Detroit is minus 7, minus 115. So there's a little extra vig associated with the line. Sounds somewhat trivial. You know, there's a, a great commercial in poker. Jennifer Harmon is, like, staring at a guy, and she's like, give me something. Give me something to, like, she's trying to get a read on the other player. Well, I'm looking at the screen, and it was flat seven when it came into the show on the sharp books. I looked at Westgate. I looked at Circa. I looked at MGM. And now I see Circa, the minus 7, minus 115. They're giving me something. They're tipping me off at seven. They think Detroit is slightly the per, the, the preference. So do I lay seven, lay a dollar ten? Maybe. But now I like my Detroit teasers even better. Look at this money line. Warning. Here comes the math. So minus 330 <laughs> is what Circus charging on the money line. Take back Raiders plus 280. Let's take an average of those two numbers, and let's call that the no-vig number. Minus 305 plus 305. If you were, if, if Circus had a sports book and they charged no-vig and they had a special, that's what their line would be, and they wouldn't make any money because, you know, you could bet both sides and break even. Well, if the no-vig number is minus 305, and I play a Detroit Lions teaser, I'm going to make this simple. I'm going to play a six-and-a-half-point teaser at DraftKings. Well, that charges, they, they charge me minus 130 on that. If I break that down, that's like laying minus 300 per leg. I warned you, there would be math. Well, if the no vig line's minus 305, and I can lay minus 300, which I'm doing by teasing the Lions down to a half and a six and a half point teaser, I'm getting the better of it by five cents. That sounds trivial. You know what? I don't even need the better of it. Basically, I'm making a bet that with no handicapping, no clue what I'm doing, if the Lions cover th th this adjusted number 50% of the time, it's a profitable bet to do the teaser. So I'm not paying any VIG. In fact, I'm being paid five cents a VIG. So now you want to jam with Lions teasers. I would absolutely endorse that right now. You mentioned about uh, yesterday you gave out a play with Jalen Hurts under 38 rush yards as a prop. Uh, just kind of expand upon a little bit in terms of props because you've gotten into that market pretty heavily now. Yeah, so I love betting guys that are clearly going to play. You know, they're on the they're not even on the injury report necessarily, but they're compromised somewhat. So last night was another example. I only like to bring up since I already brought up all the money I lost on my Northwestern Wildcats under, I like to bring up bets that I won. So Austin Eckler, they're talking about his ankle and not being 100%. So he's, he was sitting at 51 yards. I love guys that are going to play but are not going to be 100%. I think Waddle for Miami qualified several weeks. So those are some of the best bets, I think, that you can make because, let's face it, those are the, the sort of players that just are going to get priced based upon uh, year-long averages or career averages. Whereas something has fundamentally changed, I guess the flip side is, when do I want to bet on a guy? Uh, a malcontent, uh, a guy that's like crying for the ball. So for instance, on the Raiders, I want no part of any Devonte Adams unders because he's constantly t complaining about that he's not being thrown to enough. So I think until that changes, I, I'm playing Devonte Adams over or I'm passing on his prop. Let's take a peek into your mind. The first half tonight in Detroit. So... Of course, not necessarily split directly in half, but you've got the Lions laying four in the first half, Fez. You've got a total of 23. You've got a team total on the Raiders at seven and a half. You've got a team total on the Lions, 13 and a half. I think I would lean to the Detroit first half just because of this whole, it's been long documented, right? The, the, these, these West Coast teams do better in the primetime games because of their, you know, they practice earlier in the day and it's when they're used to playing earlier in the day. And then when they have to play that night game, especially later on, 
that um, those teams tend to, um, the West Coast teams do better and the East Coast teams do worse. I might add that, um, well, they are a West Coast team, but San Jose State did not get that memo at Hawaii where they just if didn't, if you didn't watch that game, it's the most one-sided game I've ever seen, even though like it went on through, you know, past midnight. But um, because of that, if I'm going to bet Detroit, I really don't want to bet them when it's midnight, their body clocks. I would lean towards um, Detroit if I had to bet the spread first half versus game. I like that distinction there in terms of based on body clock yeah, and time there. That's, that's something, Patrick, I've never heard before. No, it's tremendous. That's what you get from Fez here. Okay, uh, just a couple of things. If you're not done with the game, Fez, feel free before we get out of here uh, to throw any props or anything that you have as far as Monday Night Football. Just a few takeaways from the weekend. You know, you've got, how about this? How about somebody, a team like Minnesota, who's at Atlanta this weekend. However, they don't have a quarterback. Kirk Cousin goes down with the ACL. How do you handle a 4-4 four and four team in that spot? So they're four and four, so they won't give up. I, I, I love when, like, the media guys are talking about, are, can, are, can they still make the playoffs? Of course they can't make the playoffs. They're done, so. Um, you know who <laughs> is going to make the playoffs? The number seven team to make the playoffs probably is going to be Atlanta. So this is kind of, in, in some ways, you could say it's a playoff game other than the fact the Vikings are only going to win seven games. Cousins, I have, is being the number 11 quarterback, half a point better than a regular starting quarterback. Um, an example of a regular starting quarterback would be Geno Smith or Ryan Tannehill. Um, I've got Mullins three and a half points worse, so it's a four-point downgrade in the Vikings. So, and that's reflected in the line. Now we see what Atlanta's laying five. So we've got two teams that were pretty much, you know, priced equally until this injury, and now Atlanta should well be more than a field goal favorite. It's priced where I made it. Let's continue that exercise with the quarterback and get your rankings as well. Kenny Pickett goes down with the rib. Trubisky comes in. This is a team that plays Pittsburgh, the Titans. They host the Titans on Thursday night. So quickly here, a couple of days. So Pickett and Trubisky, I have them as being equal quarterbacks, three points worse than an average quarterback. Ooh, that puts them in with the uh, the Riddler. Uh, Ritter puts them in with uh, Mac Jones. Um, Wilson for the Jets, so just a, a terrible starting quarterback. So no difference at all in the Jets. You know, what's interesting is what do I do with the Titans? Like, where, where is this Will Levis? Four touchdown passes. I've never seen guys so wide open. So uh, I thought this was a huge downgrade for Tennessee. I've got to look and, and see what's going on with the Tennessee quarterback situation. But, um, you know, one thing, let's not overreact. I Like, I thought the Bears quarterback, Badgett, looked good in his second game, and he was terrible, obviously, against the Chargers. Next up, you mentioned Ritter, who's been bad, and then all of a sudden there's a spark with Taylor Heineke. Look, we're not expecting Taylor Heineke to be to Joe Montana, but they did score on four of his first five possessions there in the second half at Atlanta. Do you have a distinction with Ritter and Heineke? Yeah, so I got Heineke a half point better. You know, it's interesting. So I got Heineke two and a half points worse than an average starting quarterback, but that means he's a, he's a very good backup quarterback. But I think body language, and, and I'm curious, maybe Amal, you can, you can chime in on this. It sure seems like when you take out the, the quarterback that pretty much the whole team hates, not just the offense plays better, the defense plays better. They're so happy to get rid of this guy, right? I said to Patrick earlier in the game, I said, I think one of the teammates gave him a concussion at halftime. <laughs> I mean, the yeah. reality of it is it just changes the dynamic and the disposition overall and the enthusiasm because all of us, whether you're media, coaching staff, players, you can see which player is playing at a level that should be able to get this team going or one that is not. And I think Ritter, Patrick, is the one that's kind of holding them back, and everybody knows it. And maybe the Giants don't like Danny Dimes. Yeah. That's certainly possible because we saw when they went to Tyrod Taylor how much better, not that the offense played, but that the defense suddenly played looking much more energized, etc. Well, speaking of which, do we have any word there? I thought Jones was cleared to play, big guy. They're going to be at Vegas, the Giants, next week. So my assumption is it's going to be Daniel Jones. You're shaking your head yes, Dustin. Let's take that and go over to Fezzik with the information. What do you do with that? So at, obviously we're looking at Vegas. I'm going to pull back the curtain and make a suggestion here. Um, you've got a, um, a Giants team that I have four points worse than average with Danny Dimes. I've got Vegas two and a half points worse than average. So Vegas minus one half on a neutral. We give them one and a half for home field. We make Vegas three, um, and that's what the spread is. But doesn't that seem a little bit high um, considering Vegas? I tell you what, we have the worst like home crowd advantage 
in anywhere in the NFL because everyone loves to come to Vegas. It's a nice vacation, although you would have to be out of your mind to come in November with the F1 race and all the construction. <laughs> but there, there's plenty of Giants fans that are around Vegas already or in L.A. that might drive up. So this is another game where, what do you, what do you think, Dustin, maybe maybe 55% of the fans will be Vegas fans? Well, yeah, and the fact that it's not Tommy DeVito means more Giants fans will be here. Had there been Tommy DeVito starting at quarterback, I think you would have seen Giants fans selling their tickets. So, yeah, the Giants <laughs> fans will be coming. We, we, we killed them all for jumping all over the F1 traffic last <laughs> week, and I will say nobody is more famous for bitching about the F1 traffic than Steve Fezzik <laughs> at Fezzik Sports on Twitter. Correct, Mr. Fez? Well, Mike Palm defended the F1 the other night, and I immediately lowered his, his power rating six points. <laughs> so um, let's just say maybe, maybe maybe Mike is friends with who run construction companies is my only explanation. <laughs> so like fair that. to say you're not, you're not going to binge the F1 series on Netflix this weekend? <laughs> It's just gonna be—it's gonna be hard to get into Treasure Island to make a bet in their book. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Logistics. Go to Veasan.com/slash subscribe to become a Veasan Pro subscriber today.